Hey everybody, welcome to my new video here. Today we're going to be talking about this guy here. Uh, this is the IBM Personal Computer 350 and it's still really gross and dirty because I just picked this thing up yesterday for a couple bucks. Uh, it was sitting in my car and I have just now brought it in. I haven't powered it on, uh, haven't done anything with it. So uh, I have no idea what condition this thing is in uh, whatsoever, but it looked really cool. I've been looking for an IBM, but I was looking for more one with an AGP slot, and I just kind of picked this up. Uh, I did a little bit of research on the internet, so this is a little bit older model, mid-90s. It is kind of the higher end one from the mid-90s, uh, since it has more bays. Uh, there was another, I think there was like a 340, uh, and it had it was a little bit smaller. But yeah, this one uh, is still pretty decent. Now, there's a bunch of like sub-models of this and uh, I was getting a little excited because some of these actually have 46 boards in them or uh, like the original Pentium socket 3 with the Pentium 60 and the Pentium 66 and I was kind of hoping that's what this would be uh, but after I looked at the model number uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to be pretty boring inside probably a socket 7 maybe a socket 5 but I'm pretty sure it's just going to be a really bog standard kind of boring socket 7 uh, so I don't know what I might do to spice this machine up a little bit if that is the case which it probably is so uh, I guess we're just gonna go on a little journey with me discovering if this thing even works if it even powers on because I have no clue <laughs> whatsoever so just looking over this thing it's a pretty cool case um, let's see we got the hard drive indicator and the power uh, this is the our power button it feels very sort of stiff there now this thing is kind of cool it slides over and yeah that's that's disgusting <laughs> but uh, floppy drive up here 1.44 megabytes we have a little little thing here a little cutout uh, I believe that was for uh, like a laptop type like a PC oh I don't know what it had PC MCA or something cards uh, and then we have, looks like, two five and a quarter inch bays. And I'm starting to wonder, I wonder if this PC was ever actually used. Because uh, I would expect if this was used, someone would at least have thrown a CD drive in here or something. But uh, this may have just just been sitting in a warehouse for a long, long time. Uh, maybe they took it out of the box and it's just been sitting there. Because when I did pick this up, it was kind of like a a flea market yard sale sort of thing and there was another one there too it was about in the same condition so I, I wonder if these are just like I mean it's really dusty and dirty for something that would be new old stock but maybe it was just like maybe they were just stacked in like a out like a barn or something <laughs> not necessarily a barn but I don't know but yeah here we go it says P100 on it so I'm guessing there's a Pentium 100 in there I guess that could be socket 5, it's it's probably socket 7, uh, at least that's what the other model tells me, 6587, so looking that up on uh, the internet, I believe that corresponds to having a socket 7 motherboard, which is not as exciting, but I do like this case, um, so that means no AGP, which is a shame, but let's turn it around, uh, I don't even know how I'm going to open this thing uh, okay so uh, there's some kind of weird goo <laughs> on the uh, the board here must be the feet on it are probably melting um, uh, yeah okay so here we go the back uh, here's the keys uh, there is a little key thing on the front. Uh, you probably need to open it to kind of secure it. That's, I remember I picked this one because it had keys, and the other one didn't have keys. I assume these are the keys to this case. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, though. <laughs> Standard power. Uh, some kind of cutout. Don't know what it's for. Looks like we got space for one, two, three, four, five expansion cards. Probably just ISA, PCI, if it's an early uh, socket 7. Probably uses a riser card. Uh, what do we have here? Looks like a monitor port. Um, I think this has built-in uh, VGA printer port. Yeah, two USB, PS2 mouse keyboard, uh, serial, and then 
Uh, I have no idea what this is. It looks like... It's not VGA. It kind of looks like a, like an old port for like CGA. Uh, and then it has this weird symbol that looks like a bubble with sound waves emanating from it. So I have no clue what that is. Um, I don't know. So uh, I'm going to see if I can open this thing up. And then we'll just confirm uh, if it is as dull inside. Uh, as I suspect it is. So, so I don't see expansion cards either. If this was in use, I would expect there would be like a network card at least in there or, or something. So I don't know. We're going to open up. Hopefully there's no nasty surprises in there like a scorpion or roaches or spiders. So I guess we will find out. Okay, yeah, here's, see, here's the underside of it. I've seen this before. You get this a lot in the desert. Um, these rubber, or they were rubber. Uh, little stands on here. They have, they've melted, just completely have melted, and they're still, like, really melty. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, this happens when you have used computers are just kind of sitting in untemperature regulated areas out in the desert. Uh, I see this a lot. It's really annoying and gross and uh, kind of hard to clean up, so I just have to be mindful of that. Uh, when I place this anywhere. So yeah, I can't figure out how to open this case. Um, I downloaded the PDF of the manual online and it doesn't seem to have any illustrations or anything on how to open the case. Uh, there's a couple people on YouTube that have done videos, but conveniently they skip over opening the case. They're just talking about it and then poof, here's the machine without the case. So that's not really any help. So apparently I'm just an idiot and I cannot open the case. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I, um, yeah, I mean, I tried with the thing locked and unlocked. I, I think it has something to do with this, either pushing down and pulling or up and pulling, but, um, I can't get the damn case off. And apparently everyone else doesn't have any trouble getting the case off, but, uh, yeah, I, I've had this issue with IBMs before. Sometimes they're a little bit strange. Um, also that thing down here, um, this... That's uh, for an infrared port, and that port I was talking about on the front is a PCMCIA port uh, for those that are interested. So I'm going to get to work again trying to get this case off. Okay, so getting into this thing is actually a lot easier than... than it was It was easy. I, I, I don't know what the... I just wasn't pushing this down far enough. That's all you have to do. Push this down real far and then pull the case uh, back off and has uh, I like when they have these cool little diagrams of the board on there and uh, I don't know okay so yeah here's the board it it does kind of look more socket 5-ish than socket 7 uh, but I still don't know um, here we have our RAM uh, two different types maybe this is SD RAM and this is 72 pin maybe um, here we have PCI and 16-bit ISA like I thought and kind of a weird sort of staggered by uh, like shared slots there's the S3 Trio 64V plus video chip um, looks like video RAM uh, it's a little bit dark I don't know if you can see that looks like there was video RAM added or maybe that just came uh, standard there. Um, it looks like the cache, like a coast module right here for cache. Uh, I believe it's either going to be 256 or 512 uh, KB. And on this side, AT style power supply. Can't really see much else. Unfortunately, the CPU is uh, under there. So, what I think I'm going to do, I'm going to clean this up a little, brush it off. I don't know if I want to get to the CPU just yet. Just clean up this dust a little bit. And I think we're just going to plug it in and fire it up. And uh, see what happens and then go from there. There is a hard drive here. See, there, there's that thing where I said it should accept the uh, PCI MCA cards. But there's no actual like interface thing behind it. So maybe that was just an option. And there's the floppy drive. So, uh, so just going to clean this thing up and then we'll go from there. All right, so it is a definitely socket 7. Um, see this, this is all one piece here. The holder for the, the caddy for the um, 
you know your hard drive and uh, what you do you just there's one screw you just unscrew and then you kind of lift it up and pull away and um, there's actually another power connector it looks like an like an aux power connector probably can't see it it's it's down there and um, but yeah it's it's definitely socket seven uh, early socket seven board I I don't I don't know what to do with this thing um, I sort of do I have an idea some ideas what to do with it but I, I think I've stated in another video uh, I'm so like socket seven just so boring to me now I've seen so many of them um, there's still some neat fun things maybe I can do with this um, I do like the case uh, maybe we'll replace uh, that guy there which is my old tiny Pentium 75 machine but I don't know I mean I'll either put the Pentium 75 in this guy uh, but I don't know, I still might actually like that case more than this IBM case. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. Uh, but anyways, before any of that, anyways, let's just plug it in and see if it even powers up. Oop, we got video signal. It's not IBM, there's probably something weird that... <laughs> It, it will, I'll get some weird code. I may force me to change the battery or something. Well, I did. Uh, well, I did get a CMOS battery error. That's to be expected. But uh, it looks like the Pentium is a 133 megahertz, and it says I have zero cache. But I' pretty sure that's a cache stick on the motherboard. Uh, 31 megabytes of memory. It was 32 ish. Um, so, uh, 853 megabyte hard drive, so, I don't know, we'll just have to see if I can get into that hard drive. So here's something, I kind of wanted to uh, make all the RAM uniform, as in, I wanted to get rid of these uh, 272 pin sticks and just put in one of the sticks of uh, SD RAM, replace this one, because we've got uh, one 16 megabyte stick of this, and then we had two uh, 8 megabyte 72 pins, and I just wanted to have just one stick of RAM so I was just gonna put in a uh, 32 megabyte uh, uh, so I was just gonna put in one 32 megabyte uh, stick uh, like this but uh, that's proving very difficult because you'll see here uh, these okay so if you see here that installs just fine but and I tried multiple 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 sticks uh, different sticks and if I use anything else it looks like it's going to fit but it doesn't it's just a little tiny bit off so it's probably hard to tell here but as you can see, I mean, they line up. It looks pretty good, but it's the this non-IBM stick is just a little bit like it's a little bit longer here and a little bit short. It's just it's it's almost it's like it's the same, but it's like offset just a little bit. So I'm just going to leave it as it is uh, and not force the issue, especially because on this uh, handy dandy spec sheet here, um, it does show. It, I'm not even really sure it would take uh, just a 30 well it does say 32 but on here it doesn't say if you want 32 megabytes uh, it says you need to put a 16 megabyte stick and then you do have to use uh, the uh, bank one um, I don't know if that's true or not but I couldn't get my 32 megabyte uh, 168 pin uh, RAM into that slot because of the weird slightly different sort of offset size uh, I'm just gonna leave it as it is and uh, 32 megabytes is more than enough for this build so basically getting this thing apart is a little bit of a nightmare because I wanted to install a CD drive CD-ROM drive but to do that of course I had to take out one of these whatever they're called uh, bezels things and to do that I had to remove this whole thing and to do that I had to remove this whole thing and I mean that's not too horrible but um, this thing here unless I'm missing something 
was held in right here by this horrible, like, really hard plastic screw thing um, that I had to, like, force out with a screwdriver, and uh, it was horrible, and uh, I think, I don't know what IBM was thinking. I guess they didn't want the user taking this thing apart. Uh, it's a very Apple sort of thing, but but then again, there's like no drive. Of course, someone's gonna want to add drives if you have bays, especially like a CD drive. So I don't know why this was so difficult. I, I maybe I don't. Maybe it's me. I'm missing something. I tried to take this the face bezel or the face plate off. And, uh, you know, it's usual, it's these little thing, plastic tabs, and you hold them all down and pull it off, but um, it did not want to come off at all, so it was actually just easier to fight with this screw thing here. Alright, well here's our machine after I've cleaned it up a little bit. I didn't go too crazy on it, but I think it's looking uh, pretty nice. Um, I think I'm going to go back on what I said earlier. I don't think this was never used. I think maybe this got a little bit of use. I mean, who can say? Um, but it does seem to have a little wear and tear on it. Although I do find it weird that it didn't seem like they just kept it stock. Um, but maybe it was just like an office or something where they didn't need anything to, you know, they didn't need much from it. But it was a little weird that someone didn't even upgrade it to like a CD-ROM drive or something. Anything. Yeah, the discoloration's a little bit weird because, um, I don't know, uh, it might just be slightly different plastics, because this is a little bit yellowed. It's it's not horrible, but you can certainly tell. And it's this bezel piece here and right here. Uh, but this piece isn't, which is weird, because if there was sunlight coming on it, whether this was open or shut, uh, this would have got the same amount of exposure, I would think. Um, it would always be exposed, so... Uh, maybe this is just different plastic than this, but um, yeah, I did add the CD-ROM drive. It wasn't easy. It wasn't as easy as it should have been. Um, it was just kind of hard to take this thing apart inside. Uh, it's like, it's really almost Apple-esque in a way that it didn't seem like IBM really wanted you opening this and messing it around with it. Now, opening, getting this top case off was my stupidity. It's super simple. But even getting, like, this bay area out, it was just, there's a weird little plastic screw that was just very hard to, to get out. And how these are in, you can't just pop them out. Um, you have to take, like, the bays out. Unless I was doing it completely weird and backwards. It's just not impossible. It's just a little harder to do than it should have been. But um, I found out after I installed this uh, CD-ROM drive, this is actually an IBM driver. At least it has a sticker on it that it's from... Uh, like, an, I must have taken this out of an IBM at some point in time. Um, so that's cool because it matches. I still don't really understand this slot here, this punch out. Like, it's the, the um, manual and stuff says this is for a PC, uh, PCMCIA, I believe, uh, cards. But there's nothing behind this. There, there's no interface for it. It's just a cutout. Um, so maybe that's just certain models. Maybe that was just an option. That would have been cool. Uh, if this machine was all set up for it, but yeah, I've never messed with those. I don't. I know next to nothing about laptops and laptop type interfaces. I just don't really like laptops. I, you know, I take them to work and use them here and there, but I just prefer full setups. So laptops to me always just seem like lesser versions of something. I, I get the portability, convenience aspect, but I just I've always avoided using them if I could use you know a full kind of rig setup, um, but that's beside the point. But yeah, um, I kind of think I figured out what I'm going to do with this machine, but I have pretty much none of the parts I need to do that with, so uh, I guess I'm going to step back from this for a minute till I get what I want coming in, and then I'll continue the video. So uh, I guess with the magic of editing, we will flash ahead to the future. Alright, so the first upgrade I wanted to do was the CPU. And I had a couple different ideas I wanted to go with uh, with the CPU. Um, so this board, the motherboard in this machine, uh, if you look at the spec sheets and everything, it explicitly only states that it takes Pentium processors up to uh, Pentium 200. 
but it it's very explicit with it it wants an intel it doesn't mention anything from amd or cyrix or anything else but i did want to do something a little different and uh i got this today actually this chip uh this is a cyrix chip interesting way they pack this um but it's an ibm branded one it's it's probably hard to see it's really worn out here but yeah it'll be funny if an IBM branded CPU for the same socket uh, doesn't work in an, <laughs> an IBM machine that would be kind of ironic I guess but yeah I figured an IBM CPU uh, well branded it's a Cyrix but an IBM branded Cyrix CPU in an IBM machine would be kind of cool um, and this is going to be a nice little uh, upgrade theoretically so what we got in there now is a Pentium 133 uh, megahertz which is a a fine CPU, really nice for sort of a fast DOS machine. Um, I wholeheartedly recommend that CPU if you're building a uh, a DOS machine, like a faster DOS machine. But uh, I'm gonna gear this more towards Windows. I'm gonna I'm shooting at kind of the 1997 time frame, so I'm gonna have 90 Windows 95 on this as well as DOS uh, under that. But uh, I wanted to go with something a little bit more powerful. But I also wanted to play it safe. Uh, just in case, just to minimize hassle. So uh, this is the IBM, uh, this is the 6X86 P166 Plus. Now uh, this is the most similar CPU I could find uh, to the uh, Intel 133 that's in there. So this runs the same front side bus of 66 megahertz. It uses the same 3.3 volts for voltage and uh, technically it is the same megahertz. This is a 133 megahertz CPU, but since it's a different architecture, a little bit more efficient or just different, um, it actually runs faster at the same clock speed. So even though this is clocked at the same speed as the Intel CPU in this machine, it's actually faster. Um, it has a P, usually it's a PR rating, but it's P166 plus. So you'd think maybe it's the equivalent of a Pentium 166, but from what I'm reading, it's actually closer to a Pentium 200. So this should be a nice little CPU upgrade provided it works. Now, theoretically, all I'm gonna need to do is pop out the Intel chip and stick this one in. And uh, that should be all I have to do. I shouldn't have to change jumpers or switches or anything because it's exactly the same. Same voltage, uh, same front side bus. Now, the only hiccup I think we might have is uh, unless the BIOS is really strange about it, but usually that's not a factor. Usually, if the BIOS doesn't explicitly support a CPU, at least in my experience, uh, you might just get a weird, like, error at post. Like, it will say unknown for the CPU, or it'll give you a bunch of garbage, or it'll give you, like, really wrong speeds. Um, but usually after that, it will boot up the OS and work just fine. So that's, if there's any problems, that's what I would expect. But it is an IBM... Uh, <laughs> Uh, so who knows, maybe we'll get some weird error or we'll refuse to uh, get past post if you have anything but an Intel, but I seriously doubt that. So hopefully this will work out and this will be a nice little upgrade. Alright, so finally we have this guy here. I've had this sitting around for a while. Um, this is the Soundtastic 16 plug and play. This is based on the Opi chipset, the 931 chipset, I believe. And I have everything in here. I have the card, yeah, the Opti 931 3D amplified. Um, it's ISA, so that will help with DOS. Um, we have 16 bit stereo, blah, 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 blah. Sound Blaster Pro, AdLib compatible. MPU 401, Windows Sound System compatible blah 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 so that's nice that that's kind of nice but this is kind of from what I've read kind of a cruddy sound card but that's okay because we're not going for the high end with this build we're just we're just going for something different now the thing is I couldn't find on any of this material a date um, but I didn't see any references to Windows 98 so I'm assuming this card came out before 1998. Uh, yeah, here's the card itself. Doesn't look all that fancy. There's our Opti uh, 931. Now, <laughs> the uh, previous cards used a clone, I, from what I've read, a clone that was closer to the uh, Yamaha OPL, the FM chip. Uh, but with this one, they went with Opti FM, which was kind of like their own version of FM. So, from the little samples I've heard and what I've read, it's it, it's not that good. 
So this will be fun. <laughs> this will be fun. Uh, we'll see how bad or maybe how good this card is. But this isn't going to be like an in-depth sound card review. We're just going to play a couple games. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. Is that for the speaker? That would be nice if it has a... You can put the speaker output through the speakers. Or the... You know what I mean. The PC speaker through your external speakers. All right, so... So I am going to open this machine, we're going to install them, and this is going to be um, hopefully not too painful of a journey. We'll see. So I doubt you can see it down there, but I wanted to replace the CMOS battery just to minimize any issues and get rid of that dead battery, CMOS battery error. But there is a little bit of corrosion in there. Not too bad, though. So I'm going to use the old Q-tip and distilled white vinegar um, trick, I guess it's a trick, and uh, try to clean that up as best I can before putting in a new battery and uh, doing our upgrades. Alright, well good news, uh, I think I at least have the hard drive working. Uh, the CD-ROM drive isn't being detected in DOS yet, but that might just be a driver issue. I'm not really sure what I did, I took out that cache stick, I cleaned it, um, I found this drive, it's just a one gigabyte uh, Quantum and uh, I got DOS set up on it on a completely different computer and then I hooked it up and it gave me like configuration errors and so I think the battery's working because it is saving settings and it even uh, saved settings from overnight when I had this thing unplugged and um, I just set it up in there and for some reason it wasn't working before and now it's working but it is sort of working now I can at least get in it boots to the hard drive I have DOS and yeah, and here I'm running a benchmark that looks pretty much like it should line up with the 133 I have in there um, with L2 cache, but I tried running cache check and it froze up on me, so I can't really confirm the L2 cache is working because it, it, it kept saying, um, you know, no L2 cache in the that setup screen, so um, I don't know, but these speeds seem to correspond from what I have written down with a similar machine that does have L2 cache working so uh, I'm not 100% sure so I'm gonna have to do some more experimenting and then once I have this thing all straightened up we will do the upgrades and see how it does alright so the hilarity with this project continues um, apparently I mean I've got everything working pretty well uh, the CMOS battery has been holding its charge it's been keeping the settings it's consistently booting to the hard drive I've got DOS going. I'm going to load Windows 95 on this machine, um, but uh, I think I talked about it in the segment prior. That was actually a couple days ago. I've been shooting this video in little segments over the period of, you know, a few weeks so far. And um, the problem was the CD drive just wasn't being detected. Well, <laughs> I, I have discovered it seems to be an issue with the CD-ROM drive itself, well, more like the, the drivers. Um, so this is the, this is an uh, IBM branded, it's not, uh, it's a Sony CD drive, uh, but it's branded, it was, when it, it was in an IBM machine, apparently, and it's actually from uh, July of 1997, so it fits the time period of this build, but it's just, it, no matter how I set it, uh, master, slave, whatever, the, um, it, the drivers just don't see it. It just says that the 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 computer sees it in the setup. It says CD-ROM drive, but the drivers just don't see it. Refuse to see it every time DOS boots up. It says no CD drive found. Um, but it has worked with literally every other drive. This Plextor drive from uh, 2000. This this Pioneer uh, drive from 2000. It's a DVD drive. Um, this other Ben Q 56 times drive from like 2007 and uh, so I'm just I'm this I'm I just don't want to fight with the drivers and, and stuff so I'm just gonna put in a later CD-ROM drive uh, either this Plex store or the Ben Q uh, CD drive so that the CD drive will not be period correct but I mean so what it's just a CD drive it's just gonna be running a little faster uh, or maybe a lot faster but it's still gonna be limited um, you know, by the, the controller and the cable anyways. So, you know, who cares? I'm, but I am going to make that concession 
um, just because I don't feel like uh, fighting, ch trying a bunch of CD drivers and stuff like that. So, um, all right. So I'm I'm just going to use either this Plex store or the BenQ. I'm going to install them both, and I'm just going to see one is a little too yellowed and one is a little too white. So I'll just see which one I like better. So I ended up going with the uh, Plex Rider from Plex Tor. Probably pronouncing that wrong. Uh, yeah, it's pretty badly yellowed. It really mismatches the case, but um, I don't know. It's it's a little bit less noisy than the BenQ one, and the BenQ one is so like new looking. I'd rather just put that in a case, um, maybe where it's always visible, that it will look a little bit better. Plus, with this one, I can always just you know, so it it's really a minor thing, anyways, but. Yeah, that, it works just fine. So, um, yeah, I don't know why the driver just weren't seeing that uh, Sony CD drive. So, all right, so uh, let's get down to it. I am going to remove these, and I am going to install the CPU, and then hopefully that works. And then if that works, I'm going to put in the sound card, and we'll just we'll see some gameplay. All right, so I have the Cyrix 6X86 uh, installed. I've read some different things about these. <laughs> Um, I read some articles that they overheat really, really easy, but they said those, the ones that are IBM branded, don't. Um, so, I don't know. I guess we'll see. Um, looks like there must have been some, like, real thermal paste crusted on this that they scraped off. It scraped a lot of the branding off, but, um, not a big deal. Uh, this is the former thing. We have a non-MMX, uh, Pentium 133, and, um, I'm gonna try to put... This was the original heatsink. It didn't have a fan on it. It was just the uh, CPU and the heatsink. But with the, I don't, I don't know. This, it's the same speed, but I do think these run hotter. So I'd like to put this on it with a fan. Uh, it's the same height actually. The heatsink's shorter, uh, but it ends up being the same height because of the fan. But there's no fan header on this motherboard, so I'm just gonna have to use a adapter or something. So we'll see. All right, here's the moment of truth. Let's see if it recognizes that um, Cirrus slash IBM five uh, X eighty six. Should it should? It's the exact same voltage and uh, front side bus. So any problems? Like I said a hundred times, I'm expecting it to be some sort of BIOS issue. Uh, well, it's not. It's not beeping, but I'm also not getting getting an image. All right, so after some fiddling with it, um, not sure what was wrong. Maybe something was making contact, or maybe the um, heat seek was on a little too tight. I, I don't even know if that would affect things, but uh, I did get it to work with the Cyrix. So we'll just hit the power button and. Well, that's where the fan's not spinning up. Oh, it's hitting something. But look, <laughs> it is powering on. So this will accept Cyrix and I'm assuming AMD CPUs as well, uh, even though it's does it's not stated anywhere that it takes anything other than uh, Intel. Although I guess that's not too uncommon. Um, it's not getting real hot yet, but there's something. Huh, weird. Something is in the way with this fan. See? Here, let me... I want to figure that out before we go too, uh, any further here. Alright, and you can see here, we run uh, to check the, run, uh, the CPU identification utility. We do see the Cyrix IBM 6686 running at 133 MHz. Uh, bus clock of 66. All looks... Good, so yeah, this seems to be working fine. Alright, so where is this video heading? Um, now, I'll spare you all the footage, because I did take a lot of footage, but, uh, you know, just for time sake, uh, I'm cutting a lot of it out of this video, but uh, I had a lot of trouble getting Windows to work on this machine for whatever reason. Windows 95 at first and then I tried um, 98. Now this machine is certainly capable of running uh, Windows 
Um, I, I've talked to other people that have this machine and similar machines, and they run Windows fine. Uh, it's Windows certified in the manual and everything, but uh, at the splash screen for Windows, it just kept hanging. Uh, I'm pretty sure I narrowed it down to a driver issue. Uh, I was able to do a little bit of trickery, and I could actually get into Windows without being in safe mode, but it was very unstable, and I couldn't really do much. And uh, I, I just couldn't figure out exactly what was causing this freezing issue. And believe me, I tried many, many things. Um, and just due to time constraints and just frustration, it, I'm just going to drop that idea. And instead we're going with uh, Windows 3.1. Because DOS and Windows 3.1 seem to work just fine on this machine. Um, so right now, of course, we have the Cyrix installed. And I have installed this uh, Opti card. <laughs> The weird thing about this card is, even though it functions in DOS, uh, there's no actual DOS installer. Uh, you have to actually have Windows 3, unless there's some weird workaround, you actually have to have Windows 3.1 or Windows 3 installed, and then you install the drivers there, and then it kind of sets it up in DOS. But you can't do it, you can't install this card uh, just from straight DOS. Now you can probably put in the command line for the Sound Blaster, Pro compatibility, and um, you could probably just put in the command line like you can with a lot of Sound Blaster cards, uh, and it would probably work with a lot of games. But if you really want to install those drivers, you need to have apparently at least 3.1 installed, which was I thought was a little weird that there weren't didn't seem to be dedicated DOS drivers for this card, uh, at least with the disc I had. Now that's another thing about this machine. You need to get permission for everything. I mean, not permission necessarily, but you make any change. And when you uh, restart the system, you are going to get this um, post-setup thing. Like, literally, if you even un like take out the mouse and then you restart it without the mouse, you will get a setup error that the mouse is now missing. Um, it's just, it's not difficult, but... Uh, devices. Now we're back to the uh, trio with two megabytes. Uh, actually, though, I forgot to show you the cache did start miraculously showing up. It's uh, 256 uh, KB of L2 cache on the motherboard in that Coast module. Um, so I guess when I cleaned off the contacts, uh, that was probably the problem. So yeah, that's been working now. So. Alright, so, huh, um, on a hunch, after doing all the benchmarks on this uh, IBM 350, uh, I, I had kind of a hunch, and I decided to put the Intel processor back in. So, I took out the Cyrix chip, and I put the Intel 133 that was originally in this machine back in it. Uh, and, uh, so I, then I tried installing Windows, and... Uh, first try. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was that Cyrix chip. Uh, the CPU was the reason I was freezing up on the splash screen in both Windows 95 and 98 SE. Um, now, I'm not saying the Cyrix 5x86 uh, 16, PR166 Plus is incompatible with Windows, but I am saying with my particular setup and machine, or motherboard or whatever it was preventing windows from low it would freeze consistently 95 and 98 SE at the splash screen and I I think I tried installing Windows 95 twice and 98 SE three times maybe even four times um, same place it would crack it would freeze up um, completely and that was I tried many configurations including the one that worked right now which is just the sound card and I'm just running off the built-in uh, Trio uh, video chipset. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe that Cyrix chip, maybe the 5x86, maybe it works in 95% of setups out there. Um, but this is one setup, for whatever reason, it did not let Windows uh, work. There's also, even in DOS, there are a few programs that just um, wouldn't work. Uh, I forget what it's called. Um, but anyways, there was a couple pro programs that just wouldn't work for whatever reason, but uh, once the 
Pentium was put back in, they worked. So, uh, yeah. Also, something weird I noticed. If you can see, see that there? It's like a hole. I wonder if that's there when the case is back on it. Or is that like a little entrance for bugs to get in? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think the case covers that when I put the top back on. But anyways, yeah. Uh, yeah, Windows work. First try. It installed just fine. Alright, so I said I wasn't going to throw too many uh, benchmarks at you, but i got to do a couple here. Now, uh, I've tested three CPUs in this machine, a Pentium 133, uh, which is what came installed in this machine, a Pentium 200, and then the IBM branded Cirrix PR166 Plus CPU. Um, now, officially this machine really shouldn't take anything above a Pentium 200 Classic. I believe the MMX chips, uh, the voltage is a little bit different now we're not talking about adapters and stuff which you can probably find um, but just standard put the chip in uh, I have heard that the machine does support MMX processors but I don't know if I trust that information because I do believe the voltage is a little bit different they might run though but they might run hot I'm not sure I didn't really want to risk putting one in uh, I will say that my machine didn't have jumper settings for the Pentium 200 but if you set it as a Pentium 120 it detects and runs fine as a Pentium 200 at 200 megahertz so let's just go over these uh, numbers really quick here they're pretty much what you would expect uh, but I think the most interesting is just looking at that uh, Cirrix, the IBM branded Cirrix 5x86, the PR166 Plus. Now, 3D Bench seems to really favor that CPU for whatever reason, and uh, it is the only benchmark I believe where it comes up on top over everything, followed by the Pentium 200 and then the Pentium 133. Uh, PC, PCP Bench at 320 by 200. Um, the Cirrix chip is slightly ahead of the Pentium 133 but it's only a couple frames it's hardly noticeable uh, the Pentium 200 is pulling uh, quite a few frames ahead of uh, both the other chips alright so we have Doom this is at max settings uh, again it's the same thing the uh, Cirrix chip is two frames per second faster than the Pentium 133 uh, so we've got 68 frames per second on the Cirrus chip, and then we have 76 for the Pentium 200. Now, uh, Quake is what you would expect. Uh, obviously, the Intel chips have better uh, FPU. That game was kind of optimized for Pentium chips, so the Cirrus chip falls behind in that benchmark. Uh, even falls behind the Pentium 133. So we got 23 frames per second for the Cirrus chip, we have 33 for the Pentium 133, and then we have 40 for the Pentium 200. So, um, I guess if you really wanted to be just safe and max this thing out, I would definitely recommend a Pentium 200 Classic. You're going to get the best results with that CPU, unless benchmarks for 3D Bench really mean a lot to you, uh, I would go with the Pentium 200. Pentium 133 is still a fine choice. Um, and then the Cirrus chip, uh, it, I don't, I can't recommend it. Uh, although in like tests like PCP Bench and Doom, it did a little bit better than the Pentium 133. It wasn't really that noticeable. It was only a few frames. And I also have to say, I had some compatibility problems with it. There were just, there were some programs that just wouldn't run or wouldn't run right. And I could not install uh, Windows. Uh, Windows 3.1 worked, but Windows 95 and 98 did not install. It would lock up when I had that IBM branded Cirrus chip. And I've heard others talk about having problems with this CPU as well. So uh, just on those compatibility issues, I wouldn't recommend it. So yeah, I would just go with the fastest Intel uh, Pentium you could go for this machine if you really want to max it out, which would be the uh, Pentium 200. Now, I believe you can maybe get a couple other Cirrus chips or AMD chips to work if, if the voltage was just a little bit lower, um, you know, but they might run hot because uh, this thing only takes 3.3 volt or 5 volt CPUs, so just definitely keep that in mind. So now we're going to look at some uh, gameplay footage, uh, but before we go into gameplay footage, I, I I have to say I apologize again for I've been doing this for three years I've been do you know I could just go the easy route and do DOS box but no I just I keep wanting to capture actual footage from the machines to give you a good idea of the exact speed unfortunately I 
still after all this time have no freaking idea how to optimize or run my software so uh, I was playing around this time with aspect ratios for some reason and uh, so it's it's gonna look a little weird uh, and it's a little bit muddled and the sound works you can hear it fine uh, but it's a little bit muddled um, but yeah if it sounds weird that member we're using that opti chip from that sound card so uh, it definitely sounds a little off. I'm not really an audiophile, uh, so sometimes I can't really tell, but even to my ears, a couple of things like Doom didn't sound quite right, because uh, remember the sound card does not have a actual FM chip on it, Yamaha OPL chip, so uh, just keep that in mind. I apologize for the quality. I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I just can't get a grip on this software for whatever reason. So uh, let's look at some gameplay. And a quick note, all of this uh, game capture footage was with the IBM Cyrix uh, 6X86 installed. So this is all footage from that uh, Cyrix PR166 Plus CPU. Um, right here, this is, I was trying to play I Have No Mouth, but I must scream, uh, but I got a weird error. <laughs> so remember, this is also with that Opti card and with the Trio uh, video chips, that the built-in chips in it. You also notice the image is cut off a little on the left. Uh, yeah, that's just a screw up. Uh, it actually ended up correcting itself after I shot all this footage, but yeah.
right, so my feelings on the IBM Personal Computer 350, um, I think it's a decent machine. Uh, I like the case. I like the, the sliding panel on the front of it. Um, it's easy to take off, yet still sturdy. There's no screws, just that tab on the back. Now, <clears throat> the reason I've had trouble taking the case off is because I had those uh, the little feet melt and it got in there and it gooed it all up. So uh, you shouldn't have that trouble if you come across one of these, unless you're in the desert and your feet have melted as well. The one minor annoyance is the CMOS uh, when you boot up, if you make any changes, except changing the CPU, oddly enough, uh, it just nags you a little bit. You have to go into that setup and change it. So you change the memory or if you dis have your mouse disconnected and you don't want it connected or you just make any kind of change at all except the CPU, uh, you know, it nags you on boot and you just have to go and set up and change. It's not a big deal, very minor, but it is a little bit naggy uh, of a computer. Um, but other than that, you know, the, the motherboard, you're a little bit limited with the early Socket 7. So at least we have established here that you can indeed use uh, Cyrix and AMD chips in this motherboard, uh, provided they're 3.3 volt. And speaking of CPUs, let's talk about the CPUs and the upgrade. So uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about that IBM branded Cyrix chip. Now, these models came with a variety of CPUs. Uh, mine came with a Pentium 133. And um, it makes a really good DOS machine. That Pentium 133 is nice. It's, it's fast, but it's not too, too fast. Uh, some games will run too fast. A majority of that golden age of uh, DOS games will run just fine on this machine. And it's also suitable for a Windows 95 or 98 rig uh, as well. It will struggle with the later games, but, you know, that's okay. It is what it is. Um, as for that Cyrix CPU, though, specifically, I'm talking about the uh, PR166+. Plus. Uh, it, it does seem... Now, I didn't do a ton of benchmarks, as you saw. I played some games, and I did a couple benchmarks, uh, and it, it is, it's where you expect it to be. It, it's a little bit in front of the Pentium 133. It seems in most cases, but we're talking just a couple frames. And with the incompatibilities it seems to create... Um, I, again, your machine may it may work fine with Windows, but obviously in my case it created a weird issue where just I couldn't get Windows running. And I don't know, it's and, and Windows wasn't the only thing. There were a couple other programs too that had some issues. So for the teeny tiny kind of performance bump, I don't really think it's worth it to go with the uh, 6x86. It's just, it's just too small of a performance bump, and even in some cases it was worse, like Quake, uh, obviously, where you want a chip like a Pentium with a stronger uh, FPU in it, but yeah, it's just, it just wasn't worth it for the hassle with the incompatibilities. Now, currently in this machine I have a classic Pentium 200, and uh, that chip works great, and that's a really decent upgrade uh, for Windows. Now, uh, tip on that, if you do put a Pentium 200 in here, use the settings for the, there's a dip switch in there, so use the CPU speed settings for a Pentium 120. Other than that, not too much else to say about this rig. Um, I could talk about the sound card. Again, I apologize for the muffled sound. I, I think I need to change my entire uh, capturing setup here. Uh, maybe just get a completely different new capturing computer. Uh, move some cards over to that and whatnot, but um, the one good thing I will say about it, it was very kind of easy to set up. I mean, the fact that it wouldn't install directly from DOS was a little bit awkward, but it wasn't a huge deal, and once it did get installed, it seemed to work just fine. Um, the digital sound effects were fine. The FM music, uh, as I said, I'm not really an audiophile. Sometimes I have a hard time telling the difference between a fake FM chip and a real one, but there were some cases, at least to me, that it it did sound noticeably off. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's not, you're not getting a pure FM experience with it. But it, it seems to work, so it is passable, unless, you know, that kind of thing really bothers you here. But that won't be the last we're seeing of that card. I'm going to use it again in another uh, machine, and we'll try some other uh, games, and we'll see how good or bad that uh, FM emulation or whatever you want to call it on there uh, works. So 
Uh, yeah, that's about it for the IBM PC 350. And uh, hope you enjoyed the video. Whoop. And I'll see you in the next one. So thanks again, guys.